Friends, this is CEC UGC Educet Network. Friends, this is uh, CEC UGC Educet Network, and uh, we are running a program on Indian writing in English, uh, in English translation. And uh, today's topic uh, that we have is a Roman Bhakti poet Lal Dade, and uh, we have with us the expert, uh, Dr. Pair Nagpal. Dr. Pair Nagpal uh, <coughs> teaches English literature in Janaki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University, and uh, she has worked on Bhakti poetry a great deal. And apart from this, she also has uh, done extensive work on literary theory. She is basically a drama person, and she has published a few books on and articles on uh, European drama. Uh, she is with us today, and it's a privilege to have Dr. Pair Nagpal with us. So uh, I'll request her now to speak on this topic, that is, woman bhakti poet Lal Ded. Dr. Pail Nagpal, welcome, and uh, please give your lecture. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Um, today's lecture is on a woman bhakti poet Lal Ded. Uh, we need to keep two things in mind. One, that we are looking at a bhakti poet, and the fact that it is a woman who is a bhakti poet. These two factors are very, very important because they will in a sense determine our line of discussion today. Uh, to just give you a brief idea about uh, Lal Dead's birth, the period to which she belonged, very little is known with great certainty about her, but uh, it is believed that she was born in a Brahmin family in the village of Pampur or Pandrethan in uh, Kashmir in Srinagar. And uh, various scholars pitch her birth, you know, they give different dates. Uh, some say it was around 1300, some say around 1334, some pitch it at 1346. But broadly, scholars are in agreement that it is somewhere between 1317 and 1320. Uh, this is also the period, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the people who have uh, successively ruled in Kashmir, then we have rulers like Dulchu, then there is somebody from Tibet, Rinshin, after which we have uh, Udyandeva, uh, Kota Rani, and finally we have Shamir, and that's uh, a longish uh, period of um, uh, rule that we have. And uh, what we can see is that uh, Laldid actually belongs to this period where uh, the governance is changing uh, constantly. Uh, in terms of women and education, it is believed that there was some sense of education for women in that time and women were given some, maybe till the, about the primary level also, were educated in some form. So, uh, and Laldet also received uh, that kind of education. Uh, as was the convention, she was married off at 12 years and, uh, you know, her name was changed to Padmavati. But we know her, of course, as Laldet or uh, Lalla as she is uh, popularly uh, known as. Um, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, as I said, that little is known about her with uh, great certainty in terms of chronicles. But what we do have are hagiographic accounts and we have uh, anecdotes about her life. And today I would like to share some of these anecdotes to kind of build up a sense of the social and cultural milieu to which uh, Laldet belongs. So, uh, it, it is believed that after marriage she had to bear, uh, you know, quite a lot uh, in her in-law's house and uh, was not even given food properly. So, there is an anecdote related to that, that her mother-in-law would serve uh, rice over a piece of stone so that very little had to be served to her. And one of the sayings that goes is that they may kill a big sheep or a, a tender lamb, but Lalla will have her stone all right. And this was something that was known not only uh, to Lalla's family, uh, but, uh, you know, people outside also said the same thing. And I believe that this is a saying that uh, that is prevalent till date. Uh, she would also, uh, another related factor to this was that she would leave uh, home very early before dawn and she would return late with a pitcher of water on her head. And uh, this was her daily tryst in a sense with uh, her notion of uh, the subjective and exploration of uh, her own spiritual development or a sense of communion that is there, which is very central to uh, the Bhakti movement. So uh, her husband, of course, uh, was would be very irked at this and he hit the pitcher and the water 
water it is believed and as i said these are stories that go around uh, you know lalla's life that the water remained frozen on her head and uh, she filled uh, the pots in the house and whatever was left she threw that outside and that is what is known as the lalla trag or the lalla pond and of course it is dried up uh, today from uh, what one reads but uh, the the fact that you know sh she was a real person one of the things uh, you know we get to know about her is through the lalla trag uh, her um, uh, the person from whom she actually uh, gains insights is uh, siddha shrikant and uh, another uh, interesting anecdote which is also related not just to her life but her spiritual development and what she uh, understands and the verses that she the vaks that she writes later it's uh, pretty much related to that how she is scrubbing the outside of an earthen pot and uh, you know her uh, 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 mentor and her guru tells her that you know why are you scrubbing the outside when the inside is not clean so uh, this was uh, again a very uh, popular anecdote about her life if you look at uh, you know uh, what we have of uh, lalla's uh, life in terms of you know mention in hagiographical accounts uh, there are some of these and i'll just uh, list them enumerate them to give you an overview of you know uh, how we get to know about uh, lalla only in earlier it was till the 70s we believed it was in the 17th century but now another text has been located and it is believed in the six, late 16th century so she is first mentioned in tadkiratul arafin uh, which was written towards the end of the 16th century by mulla ali rana the brother of maktum sahib and um, after which in the 17th century which is a, a proper hagiographic account uh, not a chronicle uh, baba daud mishkati in asrar ul uh, abar this is about 1654 and then again there's a gap of about 80 years and we have uh, khwaja azam didamaris uh, tarikh e azmi or as it is known as waqiat e kashmir so this is the 18th century and uh, we can see that for a poet who's you know whose birth is pitched in the 14th century there is very little mention or in fact there is no mention till the late 16th century and it's only in properly in the early 17th century that we have some uh, mention of uh, uh, somebody called lalla and uh, jayalal kaul who has done a lot of work on um, uh, uh, lalla's uh, uh, verses and has looked at uh, all the uh, source documents points out that you know in the works of jona raja kalhan and so on there is no mention that is made of uh, lal dad but it's very interesting it's fascinating almost that you know this 14th century medieval i mean medieval period bhakti poet is revered and remembered by uh, people in kashmir to date and her verses her vaks are uh, something that are recited you know it's it's part of uh, you know growing up so um this absence uh, of her from important uh, 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 works of literature and um, in, uh, important uh, epics almost uh, is very very important so um and at the same time what we understand is that she is also uh, the maker in that sense of modern kashmiri why uh, kashmiri language and literature to begin with of course you know for somebody who's uh, i mean uh, reciting the, these verses and so on uh, we shouldn't say writing because you know she was speaking them so um, these are uh, works uh, that are written of course with a lot of words that would probably be considered absolutely obsolete today they would be archaic so uh, when these were orally handed down from one period to the other what we have was what we had was uh, the the uh, rejection of certain archaic words and the addition of new words so by the time the 17th century we look at a lot of uh, what is handed down we understand that uh, as a language these uh, works have also undergone some sort of change and um, uh, towards uh, you know uh, the the end of this lecture i'm also going to bring in the issues of translation related to this so um, i'll i'll just re read out a, a quote from uh, jayalal kaul who says that one of the important aspects as we need to keep two things in mind one that she is a, a, a woman and the other is that she's part of the bhakti tradition and in that sense she's a precursor to a lot of women bhakti poets who come later so um, uh, this and the whole idea that she is uh, in a sense you know the just at the point where uh, you know kashmiri language and literature is undergoing a transformation and change is very very important here i uh, request uh, uh, dr prakash to also comment on this aspect of uh, lal dad's uh, uh, relationship to uh, you know uh, kashmiri as a language 
Oh, well, Payal, I would like to say two things. Uh, one, with respect to the first point that you made, and uh, that point is, uh, you know, that uh, uh, it's, it's a woman bhakti poet and uh, nothing is available in the authentic sense there, and that she has survived only through the anecdotes, mm -hmm. which make it a hagiographic account, okay. something that is not authentic, but something that people have been hearing. Yeah. Uh, now, this, um, what's the role of these uh, anecdotes? You know, these anecdotes don't have any source. Mm -hmm. They are there in the memory of the people. They relate to one another, uh, they, these anecdotes, and from there, you know, they kind of build an image of the poet. And uh, that image, you know, continues. So, uh, how far, uh, you know, would, would you uh, find these things important for, you know, keeping in, uh, you know, existence a whole rich tradition of bhakti? Right. What I think it's uh, it's very important to actually look at these anecdotes before we really look at uh, Lala's works. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that because there is a complete paucity of material. Mm -hmm. So these anecdotes and hagiographic accounts, they help us not only to build up a sense of Lala's life, mm -hmm. but also a sense of the period to which she belonged. And mm -hmm. for instance, uh, a lot of these anecdotes actually have to do with two factors. One her relationship with her uh, family after marriage and the other is her relationship with her guru mm -hmm. and both actually uh, translate into her uh, spiritual leanings and her understanding of herself uh, you know which of course in the modern day sense is very very crucial her understanding of herself uh, is as, as, as a woman, as a poet, I think that is where the anecdotes really help. And anecdotes also, you know, make it relevant in the make sense, you know, that, that people remember them and they relate and, and they interpret. Now, this is where, you know, the, the importance of the poet also lies. That, you know, there are stories about her. There are not stories about everybody, but about yes. a poet. And it's a woman poet and nobody knows about her, as you rightly say in the 15th century, 16th century, there is some mention. So, people want to remember such voices and therefore they create stories. In fact, it's important to keep in mind that the first time when there these uh, works are actually uh, penned and are put down, it's in the modern world. And before that, Lalla's verses have just been handed down orally mm. yes, from yes. one generation to the other. Mm. And again, since we are discussing anecdotes, these anecdotes are also handed down from one generation to the other. Mm. So I think this the, the strength of um, you know Kashmiri language literature and a sense of their cultural sensibility is a very, very, uh, the oral element is very strong here. And while you already answered the question that you asked, yeah. basically, you know, when these stories are told and when she is referred to with respect to her works, works means the statements, uh, short statements in poetry form, uh, then you know that this language itself will change because in the 16th, 16th century, somebody is presenting a work. So that work will carry the language of the 16th century and the language will keep on growing. So, in a way, she remains relevant even at the le level of language and language is growing through her works, through her statements. And it's this, a, this, this is what you have said. Yes, and, and it's a very hmm. beautiful transformative process because Lalla, of course, belonged to the 14th century. And when we uh, kind of, you know, hear uh, works from the 16th, 17th, then finally 19th and 20th centuries, what we have is that the works are obviously undergoing a transformation, especially in the context of uh, uh, both in at the level of uh, Kashmiri as a language and of course in terms of translation and at the same time the language is also undergoing a change and that is why very uh, I mean I think most scholars here are in agreement that Lala is to be credited as uh, the maker of modern Kashmiri uh, language see. and literature mm -hmm. so they, they are in unison here. And uh, uh, this uh, you know uh, idea about the bitterness that is there in, uh, in in the sensibility of people. For instance, you very rightly quoted. I would like to request you to you know say it again. Uh, there, there, there is a walk you say in which the woman is supposed to uh, eat her rice from the stone, and then somebody says, or the walk itself says, she may not have got the rice, but she got the stone. Stone. Could you could you repeat it and then explain? Yes, it? it's it's very interesting <laughs> because uh, there's a stone uh, her, uh, when she served food. Then there is a stone, and that stone is covered with a thin film of rice, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, and it's it's a very common, uh, 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 you know, now uh, saying, especially with reference to a daughter-in-law, that they may kill a big sheep or a tender lamb. Lala will have her stone all right. So that's <laughs> I see. Yes, that's what yes. it is, and and it's mm -hmm. it's very uh, prevalent to this state. Mm -hmm. So um, so uh, you can uh, tell, in fact, right in the beginning, a few walks and uh, uh, let our viewers and our scholars and friends know as to how, you know, walks operate in Kashmir, particularly uh, with reference to uh, Lalla. 
Yes. Mm. So, uh, before we uh, head there, just uh, uh, another um, idea about Kashmiri language since we were talking about this, mm -hmm. that, uh, and this is a quote from Jayalal Kaul, who says that, you know, she had thrown, and I quote, she had thrown all conventional respectability to the winds and roamed careless of dress and decorum. She did not observe the formalities of ceremonial piety. She was vehemently critical of orthodoxy, its dogma and ritual, its hypocrisy and exclusiveness. And she spoke of the secret doctrines and disciplines to all and sundry, disregarding the strict injunctions in behalf of Adhikar Bhed in the vulgar tongue of the unlettered masses. I think, uh, quote unquote, and this is an important factor, what call I think here, and uh, you know, this work was done in 1970s, 1973. Mm -hmm. So it's important to mark here that the use of the vulgar tongue of the unlettered masses, mm -hmm. the idea that now a language is to be used in the vax that is going to appeal to everybody and the common man can actually recite these vax. It is not something, I mean we know the whole Sanskritization in the ancient period and so on, but the here in the, and that was, uh, I mean a central tenet of the Bhakti movement was that the language had to be something that could be used by the common people. And Lalla's works totally fall into that category where Call credits her for having used, uh, you know, the you know uh, verses in the vulgar tongue of the unlettered masses. So, um, which means that uh, you know the uh, influences that might have come to uh, Kabir uh, in for his outspokenness uh, would be rooted actually in people like Lalla Dade. Yes, uh, and she's a rationalist. She's yes. a person you know who, who attacks conventions. Who, as, as you ri rightly have quoted, uh, sh she is very critical of uh, the ritual. And if somebody is critical of the ritual, then one relates directly to what can be called the basic sense of the masses and their experience. Mm -hmm. So, a vulgar word is very well used. Vulgar means common people. So, vulgar language means common language, language that is not, not mm -hmm. accepted by the elites. Mm -hmm. And she belongs to us, yes. the, the people, common masses. Yeah. Good point. So. Uh, Again, uh, again, a little bit uh, about uh, her, in, you know, initiation in that sense. So she left her house when she was about 26 and went to the Shaiva saint uh, Siddha Shrikanta, and that's where uh, you know she kind of uh, uh, draws her spiritual development from, and uh, which of course undergoes a further transformative process after she meets Sayyid Hussain Samnani, after which it is believed that she is converted to Islam. So in that sense, both sex, you know, you look at her as a Kashmiri uh, Shaivite poet and also somebody who's, who is at that junction where you have the influx of uh, Sufism in Kashmir. So these two are well reflected in uh, 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 Lal Dead's box and these two influences are very, very important important, uh, you know, the, even though the Sufi influence happens a little later. So, but the, the Vaks are in a sense important and very, very precious for us for this very, very um, uh, secular nature of her uh, uh, poetry. So, um, <coughs> Lalde's oh. verses, mm -hmm. uh, if you will just uh, uh, very quickly look at how they were actually recorded and handed down. So, uh, it is only in 1920, in the 20th century that is, that they were collected by Sir George Cryerson and Barnett and uh, as Ranjit Hoskute calls it the LD corpus, you know, which is, uh, you know, because it is difficult to make out whether all of these have been written by Lala or not. So, scholars have kind of worked on this and uh, all this was recorded by Pandit Mukundram uh, Shastri who, who contacted somebody who would recite Lal Dead's verses and he had, as he had learnt them in terms of family tradition. So, you know, the idea that this was being handed down orally and it is only in the 1920s that we have something called the Lala uh, Vakhyani, which is a collection of her uh, verse, works that can be read. So, we have issues of uh, orality, we have issues of transmission and that brings a very, uh, we have to be alert to this because uh, we have to keep this question in our mind about the authenticity uh, of these verses. So. Um, Call uh, strongly suggests that you know her works need to be looked at in totality, and um, uh, uh, you know when we say uh, totality, the idea is of various elements that are there. And if we really speaking look at what really is a work, a work mm -hmm. is a four-line stanza, or uh, 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 which is supposed to be complete in itself. It's supposed to be independent, and uh, at times you have companion works, but for the most, each work will have its own. Uh, idea that it will bring forth in that four line structure. I must also uh, share with the viewers that you know these four line uh, stanzas in terms of translation 
have uh, not always been restricted to a four line stanza. For instance, Ranjit Hauskote in a very modern uh, 2011 translation of Alala's works presents it as a four line um, uh, translation, but Call uh, does not and you know we actually look at it in terms of uh, 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 more lines than that. So, um, keeping the Bhakti tradition in mind, what we realize is that these works uh, need to be understood both in terms of uh, you know uh, the Kashmiri Shaivite tradition and the Sufi tradition. Do they have some criticism uh, 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 through the statements that they make, the works? Uh, yeah, lots of uh, themes, in fact, I was just going to touch upon that. Mm -hmm. For instance, there is this idea of uh, the individual being alone. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it which, which ties with what is, uh, she is generally accepted to be a Trika Shaivite uh, poet. Then there is this uh, idea of wisdom that is there in her works about how to actually, uh, you know, run your life. Then um, uh, this worldliness, she never really says that, you know, she doesn't, the Lala's works make it clear that she does not believe in this idea of two different worlds and she looks at how you are to operate within this world. And that is, you know, for instance, in one of the works, and I'll just uh, read out the translation, by pandering to your appetites, you get nowhere. By penance and fasting, you get conceit. Be moderate in food and drink and live a moderate life the gates of heaven will surely be thrown open wide for you. So it is the <coughs> present uh, day, the present life that uh, Lala talks about and uh, thinks of it as very, very important and how you actually conduct yourself in this life is very significant for her. And in fact, in another work, she very clearly outlines and says, let not your body suffer from hunger and thirst. Feed it whenever it feels famished. Fie on your fasts and religious rites do good there in your duty lies. So this goodness is goodness, moderation, <laughs> these are the ideas that uh, Lala really speaking uh, stresses on. And uh, moderation means self-control, self-preservation, not indulgence, uh, nor complete denial. Absolutely. So, not see. indulgence, not hmm. complete denial. In hmm. fact, the whole idea of uh, 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 exercise, yoga that she talks about is in a, in a sense about control over one's body. And she never negates the body. This this aspect of uh, Lala is very, very significant for us. It's not as if, you know, she uh, suggests that you have to abandon everything. In fact, on the contrary, she suggests that you have to be in control of things. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh, you might uh, uh, also say something about her uh, unconventional dress, which you have uh, hinted. So maybe that can also make clear, you know, this, this is how she can connect with the common common people. So, uh, basically, uh, Lala was against, uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, convention, any kind of orthodoxy mm -hmm. and uh, be it uh, a social convention, whether it was, she would, she would at times, in fact, there are anecdotes uh, suggesting that, you know, there were moments when she would just roam around without wearing anything and so on. So, um, she rejected orthodoxy of any sort and, in fact, always posed questions. And these questions were very searching questions and the works need to be, whatever context we place them in, but the works need to be appreciated and understood for the questions that they raise regarding the individual and her or his life. So uh, basically uh, a rational person who wants to make a statement, who wants to make criticism, wants to tell people what to think and what to raise questions as. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So maybe you can.
Welcome back viewers. Uh, in the first part of the lecture on Lalded, we discussed Lalded's life, her geographic accounts, some brief outlines about uh, her verses, the works, uh, the whole idea of a work, what really is a work. So, uh, and now in this, uh, uh, the second part of uh, Lalded's uh, works, we will have a discussion about the different works and the points that they raise. So, uh, one of the things that you know we discussed uh, earlier was the idea of rationality and uh, uh, how uh, we need to make a very clear distinction between the kind of spirituality that uh, Lalded is uh, you know advocating, practicing in her works and the fact that this is actually and if you look at it from the Bhakti tradition, then this is actually totally against any kind of convention and we should not uh, make the mistake of actually relocating it in convention and I will uh, you know refer to uh, Ranji Thoskote here who says that she cherishes these the references to her works while attacking the parasitic forms of organized religion that have attached themselves to the spiritual quest and choked it. Arid scholarship, soulless ritualism, fetished austerity and sacrifice. So these and animal sacrifice. So these are important aspects of Lalded's uh, works. The fact that she rejects these uh, you know uh, 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 conventions as they are uh, practiced. So, if we uh, uh, look at the, the trika, uh, you know, or the trika shaivism, the, the, these three forms, she is the one against the other two that practice a kind of dualist uh, belief in a dualist world. She does not believe in any kind of dualist world, and which is why it just believes in the triad, three aspects of life, which is uh, knowledge and uh, desire and action. So, hence the trika or the triad. And if you look at these three factors, be it knowledge, be it desire, be it action, they are located in this very world. And the the beauty of her box is precisely this. So, um, if we just take a look at one of the works and understand, I mean today in the 21st century particularly, 20th century onwards in fact, the idea of subjectivity and the I has been very, very importantly understood. But when we look at uh, Lal Dead, and her works, we we realize that you know in that sense she's also the precursor of a kind of uh, I wouldn't exactly want to use this word, but there is a kind of modernity that is there, and this uh, subjective development that we talk about today very commonly, I think that it, its origins lie uh, in uh, the bhakti movement, and especially in the works of uh, uh, poets like Lal Dead. So uh, I'll just read out this work with a rope of loose spun thread. Am I towing my boat upon the sea? Would that God heard my prayer and brought me safe across. Like waters in cups of clay, I run waste. Would God I were to reach my home. So, this idea of exploration, the idea that, um, you know, uh, she's alone and the idea that there is somewhere that she has to reach. So, these are all captured in, in this work. Or for that matter, uh, there is a yawning pit underneath you and you are dancing overhead. Pray, sir. How can you bring yourself to dance? See the riches that you are amassing here. Nothing of them will go with you. Pray, sir, how can you relish your food and drink? So she's absolutely, totally, uh, you know, in fact, looks a bit disgust at people who are amassing all sorts of wealth and so on. And we have to understand that, you know, the loneliness that she talks about, it is a loneliness of a woman. It is not a kind of generalized loneliness. This is the loneliness of a woman bhakti poet. Uh, another very important aspect about uh, Lalded's works is the kind of images that she makes use of. And these, if we relate it to the idea of language, you know, the, the vulgar tongue of the unlettered masses and so on, then uh, the images that she uh, uses and uh, the objects that she displays in her works are from day to day life. There is nothing exotic about them. So, for instance, a wooden bow and rush grass for an arrow, a carpenter unskilled and a palace to build a shop unlocked in a busy bazaar, a body unleashed by waters holy. Oh dear, who knows what hath befallen me. So, in this Please work, comment on this. This is, this is a wonderful work you are quoting. Yeah. Uh, please comment. Hmm. So, uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, work particularly, I am trying to draw attention to uh, more than the nuance, more than the meaning, but the mm -hmm. fact that the images that she is creating are of a absolutely ordinary day to day life. Mm -hmm. There is nothing exceptional about it. The wooden bow, the rush grass, 
she talks about a carpenter who is unskilled but at the same time there is a palace to build so it's it's actually uh, you know the 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 uh, person who's in a kind of spiritual quest is not equipped for it and is trying to kind of build that up and uh, is looking for its own uh, evolution and that very lofty idea or a sublime idea in that sense is explained through the very very ordinary i mean if we actually look at it uh, mm. you know e even in terms of um, uh, english literature mm. then i think it's only with the romantics that this kind of ordinariness in language is coming but here in the 14th century uh, lalded is talking about you know the common place and uh, the, uh, the 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 very very simple so um, you know uh, and in uh, fact uh, if you have brought in the context of english literature the only poet who would be a contemporary is chaucer who is yes. also 14th century yes uh, but she is in fact 20 years senior to him years senior. and she is talking about the simple things now the one uh, walk that you quoted uh, i'd like you to maybe uh, comment on that also and that walk is where the boat is used to journey through water this is the first walk you quoted first, please say something walk. about that yes hmm. so this walk i had actually put under what was called the theme of loneliness in the sense that this is a relationship that exists between um, the seeker and uh, you know the the powers that be in a sense so what she says is with a rope of loose spun thread am i towing my boat upon the sea so this also uh, again to my mind the fact that she is a woman who's writing this and that she's towing her boat alone upon the sea is a very significant factor it is always doubly understood especially in the context of women of that time would that god heard my prayer and brought me safe across so there is a journey that needs to be completed and she's praying that she should be able to finish that journey it could be the journey of life it could be her spiritual evolution it could be a moment that she was uh, uh, looking at and wanted to kind of you know finish it and she says like water in cups of clay i run waste would god i were to reach home so she sees that she puts in a lot of effort mm -hmm. but because circumstances are not conducive it's almost as if she's going against the current so because circumstances are not conducive she is pulling and towing at the boat tugging at the boat but she is like water in cups of clay and the water keeps seeping in fact in other translations uh, you know it's been uh, translated differently so the idea of the water seeping through these cups is brought out and she says would god i were to reach my home how how do you say that uh, it's, it's because it's a woman therefore uh, the idea of loneliness comes out so clearly i think um, uh, you know one one has to keep the context of the society of that time and again if you go back to the anecdotes and see how uh, you know she the kind of life that she was leading in fact for the time that she was uh, in her in law's house she was not really communicating with anybody she would leave early in the morning and she would come back after of course uh, you know uh, uh, thinking through things and uh, filling water carrying that pitcher on her head getting water for the house she was, she was performing all the household chores she was doing everything yet at the same time she was also looking at her spiritual journey so uh, i think it is there that this context of uh, loneliness as it is understood in a woman becomes very very important mm -hmm. because uh, uh, if we were to translate the same work in the context of a, um, a you know male poet mm -hmm. uh, i don't think that the nuances would be the same the nuances would then be understood in a different context so uh, the the sharpness of this uh and uh, as i said you know we have to relate it this is where the anecdotes become important mm -hmm. and the hagiographic accounts become important mm -hmm. has they have to be understood together mm -hmm. and that is what forms the strength of uh, lalded's uh, uh works and you also referred to dance and relishing yes. food that's another that's another work mm -hmm. uh where she says how can you bring yourself to dance pray mm -hmm. sir how can you bring yourself to dance mm -hmm. see the riches that you are amassing here mm -hmm. so and nothing of them will go with you and she's mm -hmm. totally straightforward in the 14th and she's mocking at people mm -hmm. that you are just amassing wealth and nothing of it is going to go with you how can you relish your food and drink is what she says mm -hmm. so complete disgust at, at the kind of uh, uh, possessiveness possessiveness mm -hmm. and yes. self seeking people mm -hmm. she totally rejects them mm -hmm. because the self that she's trying to create and that's where the spirituality that lalded builds up in her verses big wax becomes important because she is totally rejecting the idea of um, identifying the self in terms of monetary gains mm -hmm. she is rejecting that idea mm -hmm. and she is so spirituality based on rational understanding rational understanding i see 
That that's quite modern. Yes. E even today, you know, we have we have we have to take it as an aim. We, we are not as rationalist and as as you know, uh, talking about the, the world in which we live. And she is telling us this in the 14th century, as you say. Absolutely. In fact, that is uh, where uh, you know. I, I mean, I, when I'd quoted Hoskote saying this, that you know, the spirituality that she's building up mm -hmm. is something that actually uh, attacks the parasitic forms of organized religion that have attached themselves to her spiritual quest and choked it. So she's against all this, and uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, you know uh, ritualistic showing off is something that she rejects. So um, uh, you you also talk about romantics in this case, and romantics are known for their sensuousness. Yes. So is there sensuousness in her? Yes. I, in fact, if we look at some more works, uh, I think we'll also be able to get a broader understanding of uh, you know <coughs> the topics that she uh, really covers. For instance, uh, impart not esoteric truths to fools, nor on molasses to feed an ass. Do not sow seed in sandy beds, nor waste your oil on cakes of bran. So you know the the idea that do not waste time on fools, mm. people who are not going to even understand what you are really saying. Mm. And the same thing again. And here is a combination of a kind of sensuousness that is uh, you know combined with uh, 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 the understanding of uh, day to day life and how one is to function. So uh, I might disperse the southern clouds, I might drain out the sea, I might cure the incurable sick, but I cannot convince a fool. So, <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. Lalit mm. is just absolutely so straightforward in mm. what mm. she says, mm. and moderation she practices in every way. I mean, for her, moderation is a way of life, and she says that neither praise mm. nor any kind of uh, criticism should harm you. You should practice your life in a moderate manner. No nonsense manner. Absolutely. Mm. So no elitism, and uh, no, no big words. Mm. She talks sense. She talks sense. And uh, here's another work that you know in in the line of these two that I've just read out. Mm -hmm. She says they may abuse me or jeer at me, they may say what pleases them, they may with flowers worship me. What profits them? Whatever they do, I am indifferent to praise and blame. Mm -hmm. And there are numerous anecdotes actually related to this that you know she she carries a piece of cloth and she says that you know for people who praise her and people who criticize her she'll keep tying knots and at the end of the day it's the same so she says that she does not let anything uh, really speaking affect her so simplicity that is associated with uh, uh, islam uh, simplicity that is associated with the uh, shaivism she combines, uh, she combines both you know in, in her behavior yes. in her outlook yes mm -hmm. and th that is the important part that we have to look at laldeds works as um, uh, making a very, very secular statement and she is historically at that juncture where these two influences of both Trika Shaivism in Kashmir and uh, the influx of uh, Sufi uh, thought. So that is well re reflected in uh, Laldad's works. And uh, at the same time, she never says that uh, one is to kind of, you know, uh, reject uh, the needs of the body. So she says, let not your body suffer from hunger and thirst, feed it whenever it feels famished, fie on your fasts and religious rites, do good. <coughs> so she in, in a way combines, uh, you know, you said trika means uh, three things and you said knowledge, desire and action. So knowledge and desire generally are not supposed to go together, but in her case they are going together. Yes. And actually it, it's uh, a desire of a uh, different sort in the sense that, you know, it, it's gyan, knowledge is gyan and there's ichha shakti mm -hmm. and uh, there's kriya as an action. Mm -hmm. So um, the Ichha Shakti is the the, uh, the uh, desire, desire it could be to gain knowledge, desire to uh, understand the self and uh, which of course is related to both knowledge and performing action. So hence uh, Trika or the uh, triad that we talk about. And well, what is that? What is the word for action? Kriya. Kriya, I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so one has to put into action Gyan and Ichha Shakti together. Yes. And mm. that she does not believe it's, it's the one branch of uh, Shaivite thought that does not uh, advocate any kind of dualism. And again here I'll uh, refer to uh, Hoskote who says that, you know, the world is the playful expression of the divine and the divine and the self are one. The dualisms are illusory in uh, uh, Laldet's uh, uh, wax, in her thought. And body, in fact, is the site, uh, Hoskote points out, how body is the site of all her experiments, where you see the unity of the corporeal mm. and the cosmic. Mm -hmm. So she never rejects that. 
there is no uh, re rejection in that sense and the basic requirements are to be met and there is a lot of importance that is given to the guru so um, you know he and she says i'll read this work uh, in that uh, context who dies who is slain he who forsakes god's name and get gets involved in worldly cares it is he who dies it is he who is slain so for her and here again you know the secular nature and rationality of her spiritual quest is very very significant the idea that do not involve yourself too much in worldly cares and that is something that she keeps uh, talking about um he who does not need the kusha grass nor sesame seed flowers and water he does not need he who in honest faith accepts his guru's word on shiva meditates constantly he full of joy from action freed will not be born again so um these these uh, you know of course uh, express some of these important ideas um i would also now you know just take a few minutes to actually talk about a very important factor related to lalde's verses and that is uh, issues related to translation and uh, you know this this is a course on um, indian writing and english translation so we need to understand that the works have been translated differently in different time periods so for instance most of the works that i have read so far have been from the 1973 edition by jailal kol and if we look at uh, uh, hoskote's uh, translation of the same work it reads very different and especially because hoskote also sticks to the four line stanza like structure so the work regarding um, you know a praise how you can bring yourself to dance uh, it's very simply expressed uh, you dance above the abyss how do you manage it you can't take these dishes with you when dinner is over are you sure the buffet is tickling your palate very very modern words very uh, the cultural sensibility is a very very late 20th early 21st century cultural sensibility it is not even a mid 20th century sensibility so that i think needs to be kept in mind when we read some of these translations because if we look at uh, you know there is a yawning pit underneath you and here it is translated as you dance above the abyss or uh, how can you relish your food and drink is translated as are you sure the buffet is uh, tickling your palate so uh, we are and that uh, in fact is a question that i would also address to dr prakash that when we look at uh, lala's works uh, you know in present day translations there are new words uh, that are introduced uh, for instance there is this work that is translated by call as i will weep and weep for you my soul the world hath caught you in its spell though you cling to them with the anchor of steel not even the shadow of things you love will go with you when you are dead why then have you forgotten your own true self so here too spirituality rationality all these things go together complete rejection of dogma when it is translated in the modern translation it's translated as gently gently i weep for you my soul you've lost your heart to mr illusion you've forgotten who you are and this iron anchor not even its shadow will remain when the time comes i i somehow the, the point that you're raising is uh, <coughs> really significant and uh, this should be considered whether you know these translations should, should reflect the modern sensibility modern vocabulary or whether they should try to recreate what was there in the 14th century or later i believe that the translations which refer to historicity the words that were used earlier the words that will take us back to that time so that you know we we understand at two levels that i would prefer uh, uh, against you know that which which people like uh you know the the other one are saying yes. buffet for instance yes. buffet will not do any justice to the uh, kashmiri or to or, or to the medieval kind of uh, ethos uh, that we are looking at from our point of view what do you say uh i i felt the same it is why for the most i have actually used dialal calls uh, translations and uh, Uh, but I, I thought that it was a very fascinating idea. The idea that you know we also get to understand uh, the whole issue of translation through Lalla's works, mm -hmm. and we engage with language more so to understand that in the modern day, even though there are these new terminologies and there are these new new ways of understanding, mm -hmm. but the sense of historicity should not be left behind. Mm -hmm. That in historicity needs to be incorporated. there is a kind of distancing that in fact allows us to un understand things better you know we are placed in the 21st century and we are looking at a poet who was operating in the uh, 14th century and uh, the two vocabularies the two 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 ethos and, and another thing they are just so different so we become more objective when we look look at it from a distance if we uh, bring you know a uh, 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 lalde to our times and transplant her here yeah. in our midst then there might be some kind of cultural or other kind of confusion 
Sufism today may not mean the same thing that, that it meant at that time. Absolutely. So, this is an area viewers that uh, I think we have to consider and uh, Dr. Palanagpal is uh, raising this question uh, for us to consider. What is your own view uh, with respect to this? Uh, my own view is uh, precisely this that you know which is why I actually tried to uh, uh, read two <coughs> translations of the same work that uh, when we look at translation, when we look at translated works, uh, which particular translation we are using becomes very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, the sense of historicity is very, very crucial for um, understanding the true import of uh, that particular work, be it a work or be it any other work of literature. It's very significant to keep that in mind. And I think, uh, I mean, even though uh, translated in 1970s, Call's translation certainly continue to hold, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of significance uh, for us precisely because they, uh, here uh, Call does not use the four line stanza -like structure of the work, but manages to, uh, you know, kind of get the import of the work, uh, you know, across to the reader. And uh, so, if we can maybe, uh, you know, uh, tweak or be more flexible about the structure, but uh, the, the ideas that are brought out in Lala's works are very, very significant. And uh, uh, the, this element of rationality, this element of, uh, uh, you know, historically being at that juncture where we are looking at the confluence of two very uh, different sort of movements, the Kashmiri Shaivite and the Sufi movement. So that this, uh, for, for, for this reason, Lala's works are very, very important for us, I think. Uh, what do you think uh, would be the logic behind uh, using the modern terminology uh, that, that is being done by Hoskote? Uh, I think there is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, having really uh, read a lot of uh, his translations of Lala's works, I felt one of the things is appeal to the reader. Mm -hmm. Because we are also looking not only at a different time period, we are also looking at different generation of readers. Mm -hmm. I think that is where uh, probably Hoskote translates it with very, very uh, contemporary words like buffet, uh, Mr. Illusion and so on. So, uh, I think that is where, it, it just to kind of, you know, maybe um, um, a dialogue with the con present day reader is what uh, Hoskote, to my mind at least, is what Hoskote is looking at. But as I said that uh, we need to ask, we need to raise the question of about, uh, you know, how much of uh, the historical aspect of uh, Lala's works and uh, the way she actually would have probably brought it out remains within this. I think that should be our, uh, you know, point of departure in understanding uh, not only Lala's works but also the different translations. It means that so far as Hoskote is concerned, the concern is about uh, Sufism or the Shaivism uh, being presented to the modern reader in the modern phrase. Yes. The, that's what they modern want. Modern phraseology. So anyway, as if you know, it's, it's a, it was a part of us. It's not a part of history uh, 600 years ago. Yes. It's a part of us today yes. that we have this kind of thing in our blood. It, it is flowing in us uh, as a kind of tradition. Whereas uh, J.L. Cole would be saying that no, you separate the two. And the first thing is over. It has, it is being carried in some form, but lots of things have been rejected. You know, lots of things have been left behind. Uh, I think Sufism is not the answer today to the problems that, that we face, nor is Shaivism for that matter. So they have contributed to the fund of knowledge and that contribution should be recognized. So it, it's there for us. So these are the two views uh, and uh, these two views stand apart from each other and uh, as Dr. Pal Nagpal has uh, said it very uh, convincingly that these two views have to be uh, seen from different angles and then we have to reach our own conclusion. And your conclusion seems to be that uh, historicity should be respected mm -hmm. and that some parts of it can be interpreted for our advantage. Yes, because mm -hmm. a dialogue <coughs> between the times is mm -hmm. very, very important. A dialogue mm -hmm. between the time at which uh, you know it was written, how it was transmitted orally, and our present day. This dialogue is essential. If we if we totally uh, you know deflect to one side, mm -hmm. in uh, and uh, negate the dialogue, that becomes problematic. I think. Mm -hmm. so. Please tell for our, our advantage uh, a kind of uh, summarized version of your argument today. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So some of the factors that we actually covered uh, you know in, in today's lecture, uh, apart from. Um, uh, Lal Dead's life, uh, where she was born, her geographic accounts, anecdotes. We covered her uh, also in terms of being uh, both, uh, you know, a Trika Shaivite, Kashmiri Trika Shaivite poet, and also somebody who acknowledges in her works the influence of Sufism. And it is this uh, secularization of her 
uh, vax that becomes very important for us how they cover diverse aspects from loneliness which especially as i said in the context of being a woman it becomes all the more poignant uh, poignantly felt uh, then uh, there are these other works which tell us to practice moderation uh, not to deny the body what it, its basic needs are but to practice moderation in that and a complete disgust rejection of dogma of any kind of uh, uh, superficial display uh, lala totally rejects that and uh, i think having i mean these were written uh, in the uh, i mean these were spoken in the 14th century and transmitted since then but for us they are very precious today also for the rationality that they uh, advocate and they present i think that is very important and this moderation uh, you know in, uh, to be practiced in a way of life is what lalla's works present to us and uh, could we tell us something about the use of the four lines because you know we have this long and rich tradition of uh, poetry uh, that you know uses four lines or two lines we have doha for instance that kabir mm-hmm. uses we have songs you know by meera later you know that have six or eight lines and she is using strictly those four lines there so that this kind of tradition also is useful for us yes if so long poems are read nobody will hear them yeah. but if you just say something pithy through four lines then the the uh, effective thing would be very easily conveyed very easily conveyed and that's where because each work presents there are certain works which are presented as companion works two works going together but for the most lalla's works are independent and these are stand alone works that can be recited and the fact that the language is a language that can be spoken easily by everybody is the beauty of these works and each work will present a new idea to us and on the whole after having read a lot of lalla's works one can kind of a uh, uh, gain insight into uh, an evolution of one's own life and look at it in terms of uh, you know all these pointers about uh, spirituality rationality and moderation so the works are very very succinct in that sense and they present the idea in a very precise manner the precision is very important so well viewers uh, to come to the end of the discussion uh, dr par nagpal has told us about this very important poet of india a uh, saint poet Uh, a woman poet a po- poet you know who lived in her own time and who also had appeal for the coming generations she in fact was revived in a big way in the 17th 18th centuries and she is today with us with a much more influence than she might have had uh, in 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 the, in the intervening periods and uh, we come to the end of the discussion and uh, we expect that uh, viewers would be asking questions if not uh, uh, immediately maybe later and uh, we can then get back to because this series is going to continue we can get back to dr par nagpal when she appears next on the screen and you can ask questions about today you can ask questions that are raised later on also so friends uh, we uh, with this we close the uh, topic today and uh, uh, we'll be there to take up other issues uh, in, in in the coming sessions of uh, this discussion uh, that covers that is supposed to cover you know uh, the the important area of indian writing in english translation thank you for this and uh, you continue listening to different scholars that that are here from time to time thank you